Hi everybody. Today I want to talk about measuring and marking. Um, <laughs> at first I thought, well this will be quick. Um, I'll show everybody how much I like scribes and scratches and then that'll be it. But then uh, as I thought about it, <laughs> it seems like there's more to it than, uh, than I remember. So we're going to walk through this, some of these things that I use. Um, well, some things I use every day, some things I dug out that I maybe never have used, but are somehow here in the tool arsenal anyway. But let's talk about marking and measuring. So uh, measuring is something that um, people have been doing for thousands of years in order to build, uh, you know, architectural work and artwork and all kinds of things. I have here, I don't know where this came from, but this is the oldest measuring tool I have in the shop. And um, it's a two foot ruler. You can see it's graduated on one side with some kind of crazy uh, marks and numbers. Well, number of dents anyway. <laughs> Not sure exactly what, the, what this means. Um, and here I'll lay it down next to a, a modern article and we'll see what sense it makes. Well, the, uh, it's approximate. Okay. <laughs> so, and then this begs a question, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I promise that we will talk about tolerance and precision at some point. Um, so in the, if we start first with rulers, or what we call in the machine shop scales, we have, you know, simple ones from, uh, well, this is one I kind of remember from childhood. This has a metal edge that's designed to keep the edge from getting worn out. Um, and you can see how beautifully select the material is. This is maple, and you can see these big medullary rays, uh, meaning that this is a... Uh, quartered face and that this is a vertical, you can't see it, but it's vertical grain material. So very, very nicely done. And um, it's pretty straight. It's pretty good. Um, I can't really show you that too well, but it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice ruler. It says so right on it. Ruler and uh, the, you can also see, if you look closely, there's circular saw marks on this and there's the saw cut is so good that they were able to just leave the saw marks on the material and have this lovely surface to print the graduations on there's that here's another one wooden one also has a, a metal wear strip on it and um, I might mention that in in previous times people used ink to draw lines uh, particularly in drafting, and you don't want the ruler and the ink to intersect at the paper. So this way the, the edge of this metal strip can guide the pen so that the ink flowing on the paper isn't going to get involved with the ruler itself and make a mess, if that makes any sense. This one has <laughs> these um, helpful degree lines marked out here so that you could use it as a a simple protractor and on the back we have the eye saver. A lot of thought goes into rulers. These are rulers for drafting. Engineering scales that, uh, that you would use for making scale models. Here's a, a metal ruler in a metric and inch. Here's another antique. This is um, American made. Uh, I believe it's uh, Lufkin Rule Company. Very nice. Graduated on one side in, in fractions, uh, 30 seconds and 60 fourths, and on the other side in tenths and hundredths of an inch. And then here's a modern take on that same, same ruler. It has the same um, scales. 30 seconds and 64 on one side. 
tenths and hundredths on the other side. This one obviously is black with white letters, kind of fun, easy to read. These are the ones that I really use day to day. These are um, very important to me. These are called machinist scales. And many of them are also, you know, in fractions and decimals. Here's one that's metric with uh, decimal inches on the other side. And these are thin. They're about a half a millimeter or 20 thousandths of an inch thick. They're flexible. They're inexpensive and they're very accurate. When my dad was making things. This was the kind of ruler that he had, a folding, folding wooden rule. And <laughs> I mean, just a little historic appreciation for the amount of craftsmanship and good materials that went into this. Quite a lot of engineering. This is an old, old tool and um, beautifully made and still works as well as it ever did. And it also has this cool depth gauge for uh, measuring the depth of a hole or a step like this, which is pretty, pretty interesting that it would go on here. This is also the Lufkin company. It's called an extension rule, according to them. So that's kind of great. These are drafting tools. Um, they they have a, a piece of cork glued on the back. Again, keeps the, keeps the ink off the intersection of the straight edge and the, and the paper. And then here's, here's the longer one. So these are also in inches and millimeters. Maybe people don't know about this, but here's a, here's a device that's designed to um, uh, connect two rulers. So you can see how that would work. If you didn't have one that was long enough, you could just join two rulers with this. And then you'd have a longer ruler. Let's see, these two with tape on them are straight edges, uh, not ruled, but these are for determining the straightness of something to measure the deviation of uh, of um, straightness. And th these are ones that I use on guitars and basses. Uh, these, I've used these for a long, long time. Here's the professional version of these, a little bit bigger ones. These are start straight edges. Um, they're designed to be stored vertically and supported at these points. So this box achieves that by having the straight edge rest on these two points where the dowels are. Um, and these are, these are nice tools. They're for layout and measuring. And you want to be super careful with them not to drop them or ding them because these are, you know, reference tools in the shop. In other words, if you didn't have a surface plate or something that you knew was perfectly flat, you could, you know, verify the straightness of something that you use every day by checking it against these as a reference. And now there's, these are some varieties of scales. Here's one with a, a hook that's screwed on so that you can, you don't have to worry about trying to line up the end. You can just read it right away. It does that little chore for you. This is a kind of a cool thing that's also can be used as a depth gauge. Here's another one of those old fashioned ruler attachment gizmos or this one clamps onto this, this bar, this scale, and then allows you to add another one at 90 degrees. So that's kind of cool. And then this is also from Lufkin. It sounds, start to sound like a Lufkin commercial. This is not something that you can buy anymore. But uh, good used examples are available and just it's so beautifully made. These are Iron castings, uh, precision parts, beautiful knurling on the screws. These combination square heads with a 45 and a 90 usually come 
with a scribe included, and these are gone, but this one still, <laughs> this one still has a scribe in it. So that's handy. If you don't lose them, then there's one there. Every time you have your square, you've got one handy. We're going to shift gears and go into scribes for a minute, having looked at rules and, and straight edges. So here, here's a piece of steel that's really hard. This is probably 65 or 67 on the Rockwell C hardness scale. So that means that it's at least as hard as any chisel or plane blade in your toolbox, probably. And so to ask a regular steel scribe like this to make a, a useful mark on a, a tool this hard is too big an ask. So what we're going to do is we'll blacken this with a Sharpie, which is just an awesome way to do this. this this used to be done with, um, be nice to have one that was a little juicier, but this is okay. It used to be done with um, machinist dye, which came in a little bottle with a brush top and you'd, you'd smear blue stuff all over it. But now that we have Sharpies, we needn't bother with that. And so to make a mark on something like this, that's super hard, we have here a diamond, an industrial diamond on the end of this this tool and so when we do this you can hear the sound of it cutting and I don't know if we can get this in there we go it's a beautiful bright line really easy to work with so if you were going to grind this to this 45 degree angle that I just marked out here uh, and you had good light you wouldn't have any trouble at all seeing when you were getting close to and then eroding that line. So that's a, a nice way to lay out on hardened surfaces. Most of the layout work we do with scribes is on wood or maybe soft metals occasionally, so these usually work fine. These scribes are, um, are contemporary, uh, easy to get six or eight dollars. They're made of um, high carbon tool steel and it's important to get them sharp for most of our purposes. They need to be really sharp. I'm going to do a quick demo on how you'd make these sharp. So this this is a little bit dull feeling now. This should feel dangerous. <laughs> it should feel really really sharp and like it's about to enter your skin. This one does not. So let's stone it and buff it So do this on a, oh, it feels quite sharp now. You could also do this on a um, belt sander um, with a very fine belt. Anyway, it's quite sharp, but since we can, we're going to bring it over to our sharpening buddy here. Okay, so this is super, super sharp and pointy. Um, and although we can, we can, you know, we would normally make a, a, scribe, a straight scribe line like this with a, a scale or a ruler, I'm going to show you something else you can do with a scribe, 
that doesn't come up very often, but it's kind of a cool thing. We're gonna we're gonna cut a piece of plastic with it, and it's gonna be it's gonna be very useful for us. The other day, I was uh, marking a bridge actually for this guitar that I'm just finishing up, and I needed to describe a line on the top of the bridge um, with this um, this handy dandy. Stuart McDonald radius template, very nice, uh, very nice tool with sev sev uh, four different arcs on it. So, um, so what I used to do was just try and balance that on the edge of the bridge. I hold the bridge in the vise, and so I was basically trying to balance this card uh, over just these tiny little areas here at the top of the bridge to get a line, and it was always very difficult balancing act. So I decided that it would be more fun to have a, a template that laid flat on this surface where I could actually see what I was doing, work to my marks, relax, being able to hold it down, and then make a scribe line to, uh, to work down to. What we have here is um, a piece of uh, plastic sheet, probably styrene. We'll look at this material in a few minutes. With a piece of shim stock. This is um, 20 thousandths or half a millimeter thick. So now the job of the scribe is to follow this nice steel template without ruining it <laughs> or changing it in any way and, and to, um, to cut the plastic. So what we're going to do is with moderate pressure just repeatedly cut Plastic's a little gooey and sticky. Oops, so we're done there. Okay, there we have it. Um, it's only taken a second, and then, well, just a little burr. That takes some 320 paper. Anyway, so here we have a very accurate. template with which to draw a line here so we can, you know, we can adjust this to our marks or whatever we've decided to do so that we're going to go ahead and strike this line with a scribe on the, on the bridge. We have a lot of control over exactly where this template is. All right, so another job for the scribe, nice thing. Sometimes it'll get you out of a jam by just letting you pick up a little piece of material or even a big piece of material. Well, maybe not that big, but anyway, sometimes a little piece of material you can pick up with a scribe. Speaking of marking with scribes, maybe we should look at um, a little bit more of that right now. Here's a marking gauge. Uh, this is a kind of a Just a machine shop part, really. So this this thing will, you know, it's designed it for furniture makers. Uh, they do a lot of straight stuff, not like we do. But anyway, so that's one cool thing you can do, is to put a pencil, you know, just lay a pencil right down your mark, and then if you're going to split the line, it makes it really easy to see that go away. I actually demonstrated this. For a curved part, uh, when we were doing the bracing segment, bracing the top. Now, uh, on that, just to go over this, this that was done with a, um, a ballpoint pen. And the nice thing about that is that it makes a little smooth depression uh, in the wood. It pushes on the wood, especially soft wood that we're making braces out of. And, and what it means is that when you work up to this line with the tool, the width of that line is easy to see when you've changed the width by cutting a little bit into it and makes it easy to split the line or, or close to it. Then here's a nice piece of ebony that'll become a bridge and I think 
you know, anybody that's ever tried to work with Ebony has a lot of respect for it. A lot of people call it the king of woods, <laughs> which is, uh, which it may deserve. And then, so I know if you, if you walked up to a bandsaw with that, you might not be able to be real happy with how that worked out for you. It's tough to see, tough to get the light exactly right to get the contrast in the bottom of that little groove where the pencil is. So one thing we can do is to use um, some kind of white stuff. And this is a, just a grease pencil. And then, then you'd go ahead and, you know, you just do a little bit of this. And as you can see, now you've got a line you can't miss. Chalk is the other way to do this. Uh, I like the grease pencil, but chalk works j just as well for a lot of people. All right, so there's, there's some good lines. Good lines to split. A little bit more about squares. So as you can see, I've, I have a lot of squares. These, I confess, I don't use in day, in day to day. Neither do I use these framing squares. I have one that's maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm maybe 40 years old, and then this one's quite a bit older. And one, one thing that's interesting about these tools, when the engineers designed them, they made them quite a bit thicker in the center than, than they are at the end. So this goes from almost five millimeters or approaching 200 thousandths over here, and then down here at the, the far end, it's only um, uh, 1.8 millimeters or 75,000, something like that. So it, it's nice for the, for the worker because it makes the tool lighter. Doesn't need to be as thick here. Here's where we need the strength so that it stays square. Now, sometimes they get dropped. Let's face it, <laughs> things happen. Here's a square from my grandpa that, that I love because it's, it's pretty old. I mean, I think he had it when he was a young guy. And by the time it came to me 40 years ago, it wasn't square anymore. And so this is an old carpenter's trick where you just take a prick punch and a hammer and you, you drive the punch into the steel here. And what it does is believe it or not, um, it spreads the angle and opens the square, or you could close it by hitting it on the outside. And so I was able to adjust the squareness of it with a, a hammer and a punch. It's kind of a cool thing to know about metal and, and specifically about squares. These are machinist squares, really useful around anybody's shop for, for checking. See, that one's an old one. This one, somebody made by hand. You can see the rivets. Somebody made it for fun in their machine shop. Oh, that's not true. Oh, it says B&S. It's just an ancient brown and sharp. It says Prov R-I. Prov R-I. I think that's before the zip code. Anyway, it looks like it's handmade. And since it was made in Prov R-I, it probably was roughly handmade. All right, anyway, so there's those. And then here's one that has uh, a sliding beam. Uh, it's not graduated, so it's not a scale, but it's a, it's a square and you could, you know, effectively um, use it to, to measure or, or, or to mark. If it was tight. Use it to mark a line if you needed to, like that. And then speaking of marking, if you needed to mark a small angle, you could be happy that you had a thing like this. This is, um, again, from Lufkin Rule Company. 
this is adjustable. And right now, it's, uh, I, I know that it's set for two degrees, because that's what I was doing with it. And this makes, lets you make marks at, at shallow angles. It won't adjust very much, but you can see there's a little gap here. And then there's this little pin that pushes on this tail of the blade to change the angle. And then here's the clamp that holds it down. And it comes with these other blades that you can sneak in there. There's a, speak, speaking of sneak, there's a, a little bitty one with an interesting kind of diamond-shaped cross section. And here is a, 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 another one that will fit in here, which is graduated or ruled and also reduced so it will go in a small hole for measuring depths. This is a die maker's square because people that, that make dies often need to put a little bit of angle on the surfaces of the special tools they're making. Let's revisit the marking gauge a little bit. Here's one that a friend of mine made for his own work as a, I guess, mostly furniture making, boat building. You know, this is a, a type that is very common and, you know, a simple kind of thing here. And really, the same kind of device, um, a little bit more precise. These uh, two examples are marking gauges that I made in the machine shop here. Um, and these are used for little kind of parts marking. For example, after a bridge gets fitted to the top, it looks nice to me if this is a a, a nice even looking margin or maybe it could taper off a little bit be thicker here and tiny bit thinner at the ends. Anyway, in order to get a nice mark to start with, we're going we can use this which refers to the bottom of the bridge. Uh, it's easy to control because it's not some big, you know, long thing and it's designed just for this job to uh, to bridge the bottom of the bridge. <laughs> Um, this one I made first, and I decided that it was too fussy to try and leave it on there, so this was replaced by this tool, which is much more confidence-inspiring and gives a better, better mark. All right, so that's marking from the edge, something that's quite often done. Before we leave measuring. Let's look at tape measures. Of course, here's a modern one. Something that not everybody knows, I guess, is that on a modern tape measure, there it's arranged here so that this part of it, the, uh, the end of it, can move. And it moves, hopefully, exactly the same amount as its thickness, so that when you measure here, it measures the correct length. And then when you measure this way, it moves along and adds, adds a little dimension so that the zero is, is coincident with the inside of that little refinement. Um, here's another kind of tape measure that's pretty great. This is made by um, a drafting company. So this is kind of more architects and surveyors tool. Um, Beautiful, easy to read, and graduated in tenths of an inch. That's uh, familiar. This one is, I don't know, 100 feet long. So, for measuring buildings. And then, finally, <laughs> I thought today, maybe not everybody knows what these are, but this is kind of cool. Talk about marking. So, this is a chalk line. And it'll make a, a pretty good line for, you know, as long as you need it to. Uh, the Japanese folks have a, a similar creation, but they use black ink. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, maybe we could put a link into, uh, they look like little boats with cotton fluff in there and ink, and they're really gorgeous. And they make a beautiful, precise, inked line.
anyway, so I think we've, co <laughs> we've covered uh, this kind of straight and square part of the measuring and marking world, and uh, we're ready to move on to curves and other good stuff. <laughs>